In the previous video, I made an assertion, kind of a question really, that what if the world leaders really don't know what they're doing? And I pre presumed that they actually don't in most cases. And a lot of people wrote to me uh, in private asking, really, how can you justify that kind of assertion? They said this to me in private, I guess people don't want to look stupid in public. Well, obviously I have no problem looking stupid in public on a roughly daily basis, so let me explain. See, I have heard many different things from people in private conversations on the internet and in person, but I would rather explain it from by, by showing you that what is being done is really based on assumptions that come from an economy that no longer exists, and it is incredibly complicated in the first place. All of our heuristics have kind of broken. And I'd like to do this by describing what the Federal Reserve's job is. Now, the Federal Reserve is extremely important. It's not just the Central Bank of the United States, because 85% of world trade is denoted in U.S. dollars, and that accounts for about a quarter of the planet's GDP. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of planet Earth. So we start with that. What they do is extremely important for everybody, everywhere. Okay, so how do they make their decisions? I have to go back to 1957, when an economist named A.W. Phillips proposed what is now known as the Phillips Curve. He uh, found that there was an inverse relationship between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate, that they go opposite to each other. Now, this was the inflation rate for wages, but wages are were, at the time anyways, extremely important because every single thing that you bought had a large labor component. It was the single biggest expenditure of most industries. So when wages went up, the price of everything went up. Unemployment and inflation seem to go opposite each other. Now, this relationship was taken as basically the standard by the early 1960s, and it became what we know for the Federal Reserve as the dual mandate, balancing unemployment and inflation. Okay, We want to have a relatively low unemployment rate, but we don't want it so low that it starts unreasonably creeping up workers' wages. You say, well, isn't the goal to get more money in the hands of people? We'll get back to this later. You see, there, there are a whole bunch of assumptions that went into it. This was, this was an empirical model, a heuristic tool that could be used to guide policy. And it made sense at the time. They were looking at this thing called the labor market. Everybody that wanted a job in the United States. And you can see from this why uh, U4, the unemployment rate that excludes people who are not really attached to the uh, workforce becomes really important. U4, the headline unemployment rate, as discussed earlier, is really just a, a statistical tool for, for working these models to be used by the people who are making decisions. It's not for those of us who are struggling and all that. And certainly, if you've hired people uh, on your own, you're not looking at the labor market. You're looking for specific skills. So there are a series of problems with all of this. But at the time, 1957, wage inflation was the primary driving force for inflation overall. Inflation being what? That prices rise with time or the U.S. dollar becomes less valuable. Now, this relationship kind of broke down during the stagflation in the 1970s. It didn't really work all that well. So an alternative was proposed, primarily by Milton Friedman, that there was a natural rate of unemployment. There's a certain level at which you know, people are in between jobs or whatever, looking for things, that if you went above that, that that's when you started getting inflation. Okay? This is called the uh, NIRU, uh, the natural uh, accelerated, in, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Okay? The idea being that if we could just find out where that was and set the unemployment rate, U4 again, to that level, that we would have, uh, we would not have an inflation problem and the dollar would be stable in value. Okay, so 
this is, in a nutshell, what I've been talking about in terms of the Keynesian model, worried about workers getting uh, proper employment, and the Friedman model, the two things that go opposite each other. Now, again, almost all political theory is actually economic theory, but this is the root of it all. If you're a Keynesian, you're probably a Democrat. If you're a Friedmanite, you're probably a Republican. You never describe it in these terms, but, well, this is the balance that the Federal Reserve always had with their dual mandate, balancing unemployment and inflation. And from 1960 into almost 2003, it worked pretty well. And in fact, the whole thing was formalized in 1992 by a man named John Taylor, who proposed what's called the, the, the Taylor Rule. It's a very complex calculation that takes into account unemployment, inflation, etc., for the purpose of creating what a, a stable value to the U.S. dollar. And the Federal Reserve had been using it as guidance for, well, from 1992 on sometime into the 2000s. This is where we get into it. Now, it's a very complex calculation, a lot of calculus, and no one's sure exactly how carefully they use it. But uh, an economist named Greg Menkew, I believe I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, has an approximation. And I'll give you a, a, a link to a graph showing the actual Fed funds rate, the interest rate that the Federal Reserve sets, versus the Menkew rule. And it correlates absolutely perfectly, well, maybe not perfectly, but extremely well, up until 2008. That was the year that the Menkew rule, and probably the, the Taylor series that it approximates, the, uh, the Taylor series, the Taylor rule that it approximates, uh, broke. It went negative. And that's when we started seeing the quantitative easing. The, uh, the Taylor rule clearly promoted a negative interest rate. And rather than do that, we had quantitative easing where the Fed was pumping money directly into the economy. This is how they managed their dual mandate between unemployment and inflation. And again, we see this the different uh, emphasis reflected in our whole political system. Okay, so the Fed has a dual mandate to balance those two. Ah, uh, wait, but there's more. Again, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of planet Earth. We cannot forget that. I mean, if you raise interest rates and make dollars harder to get, that means that the value of the U.S. dollar around the world goes up. That makes our exports more... more uh, expensive certainly that's that's the case but it also has a cooling effect on the entire planet so there is a balance that needs to be struck between the value of the dollar internationally versus uh what's happening in the domestic economy so the fed really has had a triple mandate since the 1980s it also has to keep an eye on the value of the u.s dollar often sh shown by the U.S. dollar index, which is just the dollar versus major currencies around the world, generally the euro, the yen, the few other things like that. Okay, so the Fed has three things to take into account. Well, that's pretty serious. Oh, wait, there's a lot more. You see, the Federal Reserve also, as a central bank, their job is to provide liquidity to all of the banks in the system. Liquidity meaning what? The cash that's necessary to continue operations. So the things don't latch up like Lehman Brothers. And they've had to go into a tremendous overdrive uh, three times in the last 20 years, 2001, 2008, and today, providing liquidity to banks. So that's the quadruple mandate of the Federal Reserve. All right? I mean... They provide all of this cash, but they need to make sure that they're not causing too much inflation, they're taking care of unemployment, and they're preserving the value of the dollar all around the world. I mean, the liquidity, while it is a central function of what they need to do, they have to keep in mind all of these other things. And there's no sign that the uh, Taylor Rule takes into account any of it. So how do they manage all four of these things? Well, if you ask the bond traders and the stock traders how they're doing it, the answer is very simple. They must be winging it. There's just no other choice. It's too complicated. But just look for a second at the underlying dual mandate that everybody talks about between balancing inflation and unemployment. I mean, this was all created heuristically in 1957. 
we talk about the labor market as a thing and the Phillips curve that shows that relationship going you know, between the two, unemployment and inflation. Is there really one big labor market? No, there are thousands, if not millions, of individual labor markets based on specialized skills and localities and things like that. Oh, but we can, you know, look at it in bulk. This is what macroeconomics is all about. Well, we'll just look at it in bulk and, you know, it's all going to take care of itself. Really? And is labor really the most important component of inflation in this world today? Or for that matter, deflation, when the dollar becomes more valuable with time and the price of everything goes down. I mean, the productivity per worker is about three and a half times what it was in 1957. Automation has taken over many, many different things. So when you look at inflation, unemployment, is that correlation, does it really still hold? I mean, is the Phillips curve still telling us anything? The answer is probably not. I mean, there are all of these individual labor markets that are looking for skills that need to be developed with time. And that's what technology is, is it's all about techne, skills. And how do you communicate the need for any of these particular skills? This is basically what I'm going on about. Plus, in addition to all of that fragmentation of this thing that we might call the labor market, we have... Well, I mean, what if the natural rate of unemployment doesn't actually employ everybody that you need to? Oh, well, yeah, that's just something they're screwed with. See, now, as the Federal Reserve is providing all of this liquidity, the bond and stock traders are basically uh, going through trying to figure out what the Federal Reserve is doing. Again, they, they simply have to be winging it. And... A lot of them are deeply concerned about what they call the moral hazard. Uh, basically, if you get money for nothing and you don't have to work, why would you do anything productive? That's considered immoral. But having a high natural unemployment rate isn't. Okay, um, that's the problem we have right now. The reason I can say that the agencies of the planet, or for that matter, the U.S. government, really don't know what they're doing. First of all, those who respond to it, they don't know exactly what's going on. All they can say is, hey, don't fight the Fed. The Fed's given out free money, you take it, right? You may not like it, it may seem immoral, it may seem wrong. If you're a bond or stock trader, your job is to serve your clients. Just go along with the flow. So everybody goes along with it. Sounds like a conspiracy? Yeah, sort of. Um, but it's the way everything has to go down. Meanwhile, those decisions based on how much liquidity is being pumped into the market, or for that matter, the state of interest rates or quantitative easing or anything like that, are based on, first of all, juggling two different aspects of a domestic economy plus the needs of a world economy that have to be balanced out. It's an impossible task. And the only guides for it are based on an economy that, well, it's a big industrial manufacturing world with one great big labor market. That's when all of these heuristics were devised. What guidance do they really have to make these decisions, these incredibly complicated decisions that are only more global all the time with the flows of capital in and uh, labor markets that are, are uh, going international? I mean, multinational companies employ people all around the world. Remote work makes it possible for workers to work all around the world. Even the labor market itself is no longer domestic. All of the assumptions that went into the Phillips curve and eventually the Taylor rule are questionable at best. And we don't even really know what all of those assumptions were because it was a good, you know, puristic, it seemed to work. It made sense. I mean, you know, uh, simple supply and demand. The more workers you have that are fully employed, the less, the, the more they can demand higher wages. It seemed to sort of make sense until a tremendous amount of automation comes along and changes labor markets forever and they specialize and fragment and then they go international how indeed do you balance inflation and unemployment 
how indeed do you balance the domestic economy with the international economy, all while providing liquidity to banks so that things don't latch up like Lehman in, 19, in 2008? How do you do it? Basically, don't believe me. Just go through and look at anything else you want, read anything else you want. The people whose job it is to understand this and respond to it and make sensible investments for their clients will tell you. They've got to be winging it. There's just no other way. All of this is unprecedented. Now, certainly the situation with turning off the economy for a few months uh, is, is a, in a, a incredible situation. But all of this has been building for years, what makes it much more difficult. Do the people in charge of things really know what they're doing? They can't possibly. They don't have the guides to operate in a new economy. And the situation is clearly unprecedented. The number of things that they have to juggle, there is no model for them to juggle it. They have to be winging it. There's really no other choice. That's my contention.